It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to be truthful, it's the first time I've been down to this show, and I'm impressed. Uh, especially what you did for the weather for me here. Makes me feel right at home. <laughs> but anyways, uh, Don said I've been working no-till uh, since 1978. My master's thesis was planner performance in different tillage systems. And I've been working with planners, and I had a few little grants. 1981, we decided to start looking at every aspect of tillage systems. And the longer I've worked with it, the less I like tillage. In fact, when you look at my title slide there, I say residue. I don't say no-till. No-till is just a tool. The key to the system to make it work is residue out there to protect the soil. I want residue out there to keep the sun and wind off the soil surface. I want residue out there to absorb raindrop impact, uh, reduce crusting. I want the residue out there just working for me. One of the keys, though, is uniformity. And I want uniformity every day of the year when I look at my fields. And I'm going to show you a lot of examples about that and how you can improve that in your fields. Last there is systems approach. It is a production system. We're going to have a little follow-up later talking more about crop rotations, diversity, uh, water use. Again, part of the systems approach. And so we're going to hear more about that as well. I'm going to talk more about the residue side and the equipment side of things, the engineer playing with equipment. Again, a variety of tillage systems out there. When you look, we've done tillage in the past. Mother Nature's never done tillage. You know, the first one over there is a mobile plow. We do secondary tillage to try to make a more uniform seed bed. When we went to reduce till, we actually had less uniform seed beds, and we spent money trying to make tillage tools that made a more uniform seed bed in a one-pass system. To be truthful, no-till is the most uniform seed bed once you have Mother Nature working for you and with you. The key is uniformity. You know, this is one of our fields already planted. We've got residue everywhere. I say one of our fields. Most of the work I do is in eastern Nebraska, but I do have statewide responsibilities. And the pictures I'm going to show you are actually from around the Midwest and probably around the world as well. But when it comes to uh, planting, a lot of people say, well, don't you need to run residue movers? I go, why? Right now, every seed out there is in the same soil temperature and the same soil moisture under the same residue cover. That's going to give me my most uniform stands, my best yields. Now, when it comes to uniformity, though, where did the combine run last year harvesting those soybeans? Again, a uniform spread of residue, uniformity every day of the year. You know, a lot of people don't think too much that little pile of residue hiding back there on the combine axle. I don't think too much of it either when it falls off and plugs up the drill, the fertilizer rig, the planter. The majority of the residue handling problems people have at planting time is they didn't handle the residue back at harvest time. Always think ahead on that systems approach. Every step affects the next, so you have to take care of that residue. You know, here I got a chopper in the combine. Choppers, a lot of people like that because it opens up the residue so they decompose faster. If you want residue to disappear, run a chopper. We quit running choppers years ago because the residue disappears too fast. Now, this combine does not have a chaff spreader on it. You need a chaff spreader with a platform head. In this case, we're going to have windrow pods. Maybe it's in wheat harvest. You have windrow of chaff. Next spring, there's a pod windrow, less residue, pod windrow. That's two different soil temperatures, two different soil moistures. You have to spread that. I'll put the chaff spreader on way before I put the chopper on, get things spread out. Companies are improving. You know, here's a little wider head spreading the wheat residue, spreading the chaff fairly well. And again, that residue is a nice uniform height. You don't see windrows out there. It's a lot easier to no-till in something like that. Now, a chopper, if you're doing a lot of double crop, you'll like that because it does chop up that residue more so you can get in there right away. Here's a double cropper I was working with actually over in Turkey using crust buster equipment. Freshly harvested residue there and going right into plant. But when it comes down to it, when you get into dry land conditions, I want that residue taller. I want that residue to keep the sun and wind off the soil surface. There's a lot of guys out in western Kansas, western Nebraska, and Colorado have gone to stripper headers to leave that residue taller. That taller residue is far more effective at keeping that sun off the soil surface. There's been some research done on 7.5 inch height versus 15 inch height stubble versus stripper head. That stripper header is going to save you a lot more water. Now the stripper head harvest, that taller residue, depends how your first snowstorm comes. You get a wet snow with a lot of wind, that residue can go down like shown here. This is produced out in Martin, South Dakota. There's a no-tiller. That's a beautiful matter of residue, though, to conserve soil moisture, keep the sun and wind off the soil surface. He was planting sunflowers into that. Here's what it looked like after the planter went through. Again, didn't move all the residue out of the way because he wants to keep that mulch there to hold the moisture. Now, a lot of people say, well, at planting time, the soil's cooler and wetter right there. And that's only a week or two in the spring. I put on a little starter fertilizer to help that crop get started because that cooler and wetter in June, July, and August is your best friend. I don't want to push that residue away. 
Again, I, we don't like the choppers. Here's our silver seeder on wheat harvest. We let the residue come out full length. That residue decomposes fast enough for us. When we go in next spring, that residue is about toolbar height. That direct cut harvest rather than stripper header doesn't go down near as often. But again, leave the residue as tall as you can to keep the sun and wind off the soil surface. And the more residue you leave standing, the less residue there is on the ground that you have to worry about cutting and get through with your planter, your drill, or your air seeder. Corn harvest. We don't need a chaff spreader. We're lazy. We don't pull them off. You don't really need a chopper. If the corn head's doing the proper job, it's sending the corn stalks down. Only thing coming through the machine should be cobs, husks, and occasional tassel. That's easy to spread. If you're looking, uh, trying to count here, that's uh, 18 20 inch rows going through that big cat combine. The year I took this slide, this producer had a seven pivot average of 265 bushel per acre corn. He's been no tilling for years in those 20 inch rows, those slopes. You can see why he needs it. He loves the no-till, but he's processing the residue there at the combine. Contrast that to this field. That's about 90 bushel dryland corn residue the day after harvest with a combine with intermeshing snapping rolls on the corn head. Those intermeshing snapping rolls don't always get the corn stalks fed in between. As such, as you drive forward, the stalks lean over. Now, six row combine, come in there with a 12 row planter the next spring. I start planting, as I'm starting planting, half the stalks are leaning with me, the planter works great. The other half the stalks, the stalks are leaning toward me, and I catch every loose hose, wire, cable, and chain, and I cuss no-till. That's a harvest problem. That's not a planting problem. If your combine is half as wide as your cedar, two passes the same direction, two passes back, plant the same direction, your stalks are leaning, it becomes a lot easier. Now, when it comes to managing residue, that residue will hang around a long time. It's uncrushed. It's not been run through the snapping rolls. It's not touching the soil where the soil microbes live that break down the residue. If you want to catch more snow, you want residue to hang around, Cut it taller, don't process the residue. The longer you're in no-till, the taller you're going to cut your stalks simply because I don't want the stuff to break down. Your first year or two in there, you're going to say, too much residue, I need it to break down. That's where you process it with the chopper or you get it down touching the soil. Joe, here's a producer in Kansas I met. He says, put a lean bar out front of your planter. You see that pipe just suspended? As he drives, it leans those stalks over so it protects his hose wires, cables, and chains. Another lean bar on his air seeder. He plants a lot into sanding sunflower stalks. Those are pretty stiff stalks. He even filled that one full of concrete just to make sure it leans those stalks over. Well, like this one. He went a little bit bigger pipe, a little heavier, but again, it leans the stalks over such that it's standing up before planting. You get good air movement down to the soil surface so you can get out there and plant. And then as you're planting, you make the residue mulch then that's gonna help protect that soil surface. How about that field? That's about 200 bushel corn residue the day after harvest with a combine that has a knife to knife snap and roll design that processes the residue nicely. That's actually on our research farm. That was too much residue processing for us because that residue was breaking down by next spring we're having a lot of bare soil. Without tall stalks standing there, the wind would rearrange the residue. So again, we're having problems. So we're cutting our stalks a lot taller. For this one, a worst case scenario. This is a guy who went out and bought one of these colder tillage machines thinking he's going to cut up his residue so it decomposed. Yes, it cut it up, but it also cut it loose such that when wind blew, he had drifts. He's got some areas where the soil is dry, ready to plant, and actually, actually over dry. He's got other areas where the deepest drift we measured was about a foot deep, and it was wet underneath. So much for uniformity. Remember, I said uniformity every day of the year. I hate cutting residue loose. I want it standing up. Again, our silver cedar cutting our stalks a lot taller. I cut our stalks about toolbar height of the planter. That way the residue hangs around for me, but I also have air movement down that soil surface. Those taller stalks catch snow. Snow's valuable moisture, I don't want it to blow away. And I want to catch snow uniformly across the field. You know, too often I'll see snow cover like this in part of the field, and over here it's blown free because there's a big deep drift over here. Next spring, there's three different soil moistures, three different soil temperatures. Those are different planting conditions. Again, when it comes to tillage, though, uh, get turned right here. The one on your left there is from a tilled soil. And so my long-term tillage pots, that's been tilled for over 30 years. On the right side, that's a no-till tile spade full of soil. Good, beautiful soil structure. A good soil structure is that snow melts. As rain comes, the water can soak in. It doesn't run off. We get very little runoff on our long-term no-till. Compared to the tilled field next to it, 
Water just can't soak in. We don't have the pore space between the soil particles. So go to continuous no-till, build that soil structure. And again, here's another worst case example. Here's a tilled field next to a no-till field. Standing wheat stubble versus no wheat stubble. You know exactly where that water is on the tilled side. The hillside's gonna be what blow, burns up first in, in the heat of the next summer because there's no moisture there. And all that moisture is down in those drifts down in the deep areas. Again, I want taller residue standing up to catch my snow. And I definitely don't want to do this. When it comes to feeding the soil system, it's residue that makes it work. Yes, maybe you have an economic reason you have to bail up some straw and sell it. But when it comes down to it, the mulch you lose and the moisture conservation you lose and the yield you lose in your next crop, I can't afford to sell any residue. I'm going to keep all my residue in the field. A lot of people say, well, I can't no-till that wheat stubble so hard. If the sun is hitting the soil surface, yes, it will bake hard. If the residue is standing up or you got a residue mat there, the sun doesn't hit the soil surface, it doesn't get near as hard. So again, I leave my residue in the field. And again, if you go to a show like this, you'll see signs like this one. A lot of people say, well, corn residue, especially irrigated corn, you got plenty of residue, you can go ahead and get rid of some. No, I want to keep it all in the field to feed the soil system. First off, every one of those bales there, a thousand pound bale, think of it a $20 bill. That's fertilizer value alone. Now, when you start hauling that away, and, uh, irrigated corn might be three, four bales per acre, you're looking at an extra $100 fertilizer cost simply because you hauled away the nutrients. The mulch you haul away costs you a lot as well. Now that mulch, a lot of people say, well, there's plenty of cover out there anyway. Norm Clocky is over here at Garden City, Kansas. He's done some work on residue cover and reducing evaporation. Now, granted, this is under irrigation, but it happens anytime a soil surface gets wet, water will evaporate. Bare soil, 25, 50, 75 percent cover. By leaving some cover up there, he only reduced evaporation by one one hundredth of an inch per day. Now, for quick math, a hundred day growing season, that's saving only an inch of water. Now, if you left all the cover there, he reduced it three hundredths. 100 day growing season, that's three inches of water. I asked Norm about that. He says, well, you know, 50% cover cuts erosion in half. Why doesn't 50% residue cut evaporation in half? He said it's like building the best house you can with R38 insulation in the ceiling, R19 insulation in the walls, triple pane windows, and the kids leave the door open and all the heat gets out. Water does the same thing in the soil profile. You need complete cover. I leave my cover out in the field. I say I leave it about toolbar height. It rubs off the paint on our front axle of the tractor. There's a couple of visitors from the United Kingdom were out and visiting our farm. They were looking at it. And when you look at that, a lot of people say, well, you can't plant down the old row. I say, yes, you can in existing no-till. Continuous no-till is biology activity. The roots are rotting off from below. I don't have corn root balls rolling out. Now, you go into first year no-till, you'll see root balls everywhere because there's no biological activity in the soil. I've got a set of plots, so this isn't them, but right next to them, the big root ball you see there is from last year's corn. It's a drought year. It was about 80 bushel corn. This spring in April, disking time, I went out and I grabbed a hold of that and pulled it up, and that's how much soil came up with it. The small root ball next to it is from the no-till, and it's been no-till for 32 years. That was right at 100 bushel corn, 20 bushel difference last year at the drought. That root ball's rotted off from down below because the biological activity is cycling those nutrients back into the system. Longer your no-till, you'll be surprised how fast that residue disappears. Now let me back up one here. You see all that residue there at planting time? This is the same field a few weeks later. Once that residue is starting to touch the soil and soil microbes, that residue is disappearing. Again, you don't see root balls rolled out there. That's what continuous no-till does when you get the biological activity working for you. The key is disc openers. The shanks, the hose, the runners are gone. The disc openers are going to cut the residue, open up a slot, make sure they're sharp working together. Some companies go with a stagger disc. The key is sharp working together, which you got double disc. Single disc, sharp, working, so that you cut the residue. And it might look like this. Here's the guy who always plants right down the old row. That opener of the planter, open it up, drop the seed in, close it up, you can't even tell they've been through there. Now if you had a residue mover or colder in front of the opener, you disturb that root ball, you couldn't do this. We run without openers, or without uh, cleaners up in front of our openers. So the key is going to be, first is cut or handle residue, disc openers do that. Second is penetrate soil desired seeding depth. I want down pressure to make sure that planter stays down on the ground. 
springs to transfer weight from the frame to the row units, whatever it takes to make sure that unit stays in the ground. You know, if had colders up front, here's light duty down pressure springs as white planter. Companies are going without the colders. Now they're beefing up the openers in back to take the wear, tear, and abuse that colder used to take. Now they're putting better springs in back to make sure you keep the opener in the ground. Again, put weight where you need it. Cold, colders on the frame of this white planter, the weight is directly on the frame. Now if you don't have colders and you're just using the openers, down pressure springs to transfer that weight from the frame to the opener. So again, make sure there's enough weight there. Hit a new problem that I didn't have back in the 80s. RTK auto steer. People are buying planters without markers. You know, marker out there on the end added a lot of weight. Another new problem, central seed hoppers. You know, this big wide deer planter, that's a 32 row planter and 20 inch spacing there. There's basically no weight out there in the end. He had to add weights to make sure those airbags had enough resistance to push down, get those openers into the soil. He no tills corn on corn with this. Again, no residue movers up front. My weight bracket back in 1981, we had an early, or had an early riser, we had a John Deere, we had a case, uh, early riser, uh, we had a white that we leased, we had an Els Chalmers 333 no-till special. My master's thesis, I looked at six different planters, how they performed. My John Deere weight bracket, those fertilizer tanks are full of water. 200 gallons of water at 8.34 pounds per gallon is about the same as that heavy-duty emperor spring that transfers 300 pounds per row times six rows is 1,800 pounds. I filled up the water tanks, then the toolbar was heavy enough those down pressure springs could pull that planter unit down into the ground. Now a lot of people ask me, you know, how much weight or down pressure do I need? I can look at you and honestly say, yeah, I don't know. You gotta try it in your conditions with your equipment. What you do is get the planter or the drill, air seed or whatever, properly leveled, properly toolbar height, start planting a little bit. I do this a couple weeks ahead of planting season, blind planting. It's empty, it's the lightest it's gonna be. Stop with the unit in the ground, take all the depth gauge wheels. If you can spin the depth gauge wheel, you need more down pressure, tighten the springs. A couple weeks ahead of planting, you got time to buy heavy-duty springs. You got time to put some weight on there or something like that. Another reason to do it a couple weeks ahead of time, shakes up the neighbors. You're out there with your planter and he's not. But you're checking it. Now, what if you're out there the day it's time to plant and you can't get it to go on the ground? What do you do? You panic, you send the boy home to get the disc to soften the ground. So much for no-till. You know what? Even the biggest disc you can find here in the showgrounds I doubt it has 150 pounds per blade penetration ability. Even the big offsets are only 250 per blade. And you expect them to run six inches deep cutting residue. These planters, drills nowadays, down pressure springs, they give you three to 500 pounds per blade, and you only want them to run this deep. They'll cut more residue than any tillage implement out there, if you pay attention to what you're doing. Here's a producer who has colders up front. He's in Illinois, he wants colders to till the soil, because tillage dries out soil. I don't like colders because it dries out the soil. He's got 12 John Deere rear wheel weights on that planter trying to get all those colders in the ground on an eight row planter. Again, the more things you got going in the ground, the more weight it's going to take. I like less going in the ground. You know, back in the early days, here's back in the early 80s, I was working with a lot of farmers. This is an old Maximurge, old 5x7 toolbar, old light duty down pressure springs. He goes, just go and try your planter. You'll be amazed what you can go through. He's got a nice silt loam soil. He's no-tilling soybeans here in the corn residue. It works quite well. He likes planting down the old row because he hates planting in the wheel track. That's where he drove last year. By planting down the old row, the residue is protecting that row so it's not going to crust or wash out or dry out. I love controlled wheel traffic. I use that as well. And this is what the field looked like back there in the early 80s. This is planted with a Maximurge. Nothing extra on it. Standard production planter. Now some guys say, well, plant between the rows. You don't have to handle all the residue. Well, now I got some rows going in the tractor wheel track and combine wheel track from last year. I got other rows in a soft row. And I got sharp stumps of stalks chewing up my tires. We don't have to worry about our tire wear because we never drive on last year's residue. We drive planting on the old row. So, again, I like the planting on the old row. Now, be truthful though for corn on corn and irrigated conditions, the extra residue, depth control is so critical. We plant just off to the side of the old row. We avoid the wheel track because it's too hard, and we don't drive on the residue because we don't want to wear out our tires. And beside the old row, here it is in midsummer. All that residue is still in place, holding that soil cooler and wetter, get a better root system, better crop development. So again, I like to leave the residue in place. 
We tried residue movers back in the 90s when they first came out. And when we tried it, we had one company give us a residue mover, colder combination. So you go residue mover only, colder only, residue mover and colder or nothing. We need a set of plots where we look at uniformity of residue. Now, this is not those set of plots, but this is where no tiller, he's in his second year in no till. He moved over a little bit, planted his corn, moved over a little bit, planted his beans. That's nice and uniform. He doesn't need a residue mover. Again, think uniformity. Now, some people say, run the residue mover. Kicks everything out so it's nice and black, so it warms up quickly, dries out. You know what? Norm's work shows it'll warm up and dry out all year long. I want my residue back to reduce the evaporation during the rest of the growing season so I don't push it out at planting time. The problem is the wind blows in Nebraska and blows some residue back. The first seedling you see there come up quick because it was warm and dry. The next one is a little cooler, wetter, he's a little slower. The next one is warm and dry. The one behind it actually leafed out under the residue. We found we actually our yields go down because of non-uniform conditions when we run residue movers. We quit running the residue movers, even on irrigated stuff back in the 90s. And here's the research where we really went and proved it. We had replicated plots. This is going down the old row. We had flags set about every 200 feet through this field, and we told the driver when he gets that flag, shift beside the row, or onto the road, depending on which he was. When we got to the end, we reconfigured the planter and went back the other way. Right here in the foreground is the worst stand, planting down the old row with a residue mover. We rolled out the root balls. You could not get decent, uniform stands. And you may look at me and say, why the hell did you even do that? We've done it for years with fur irrigation and gravity irrigation and ridge plant. We got rid of the residue movers on our ridge plant for fur irrigation. We just no-till on top of the ridge and our yields went up because of more uniform stands. Our best stands were we planted beside the old row with no attachment at all. So that's what we evolved to. This is from a field that's irrigated corn on corn for five years. Knife to knife snack and rolls on the combine, no residue movers on the planter. Residue doesn't accumulate. Once you've got that system working with you, biological activity breaks it down. I like wheat in the rotation. I like other crops in the rotation. Diversity. Again, we'll hear more about that later. But again, with wheat, we don't run residue movers. A lot of people say you can't plant into that heavy wheat stubble. This is about 90 bushel wheat straw. We planted soybeans in the middle of April in an area of the state where they say you can't plant soybeans until May 5th because the soil's not warm enough even in till soils. By May 5th, my beans are up and growing. With good no-till soil structure under that heavy wheat residue, excess water drained away. Those beans did a lot better because they're growing there for an extra three, four weeks in the field compared to the neighbors. Let's get back to the planter. Cut or handle residue, penetrate the soil, establish seed to soil contact, close the seed V. You have to do that as well. We got a problem here. That seed is open. Angle closing wheels, I show cast iron here. Cast iron closing wheels were designed for dry, hard conditions like double croppers. Wet soil, spring planting conditions, stick with your standard tires. These are too aggressive. But the other thing is planting depth is critical with these angle closing wheels. They were designed when corn planting depths were two to three inches. If you extend them downward, they intersect an imaginary point about two inches down. If you plant shallower than that, you'll pack below the seed and you're going to have problems because you can't close the seed V. They were made design plant deeper. And here's Milo planted at an inch deep with angle closing wheels packed below the seed V. We plant our beans and our Milo at two inches because we're using a corn planter. It's designed to plant two to three inches deep. Again, think about planting depth. Evaluate seed to soil contact separate from closing the seed V. If seed to soil contact is there, you don't over tighten your press wheels trying to get the seed V close. You will cause compaction and the roots can't get out there. If you're having trouble closing the seed V, the first thing I look at is the planter running nose down. If you're running nose down, you don't have enough tail down pressure there to make the closing wheels work. Now, I apologize for don't have the pointer here. I don't think the mouse will work as a pointer either. But on the back tail section where those pr uh, press wheels are mounted, that has to be running level. If it's tail down like this, you aren't going to close the seed V. Planting depth's critical too. The first two rows on the far side are planted one inch deep. It didn't even close the seed V. If you know where to look, you can see the treated seeds. The next two rows were planted three inches deep. Those closing wheels worked fine. The row that's just up in the corner was planted two inches deep. Again, two to three inch planting depths, those wheels work fine. If you're planting shallower, a lot of people say, well, put on spoked wheels. They took off 
The standard wheels that gave you seed to soil contact and close the seed V and put on spokes that close the seed V nicely, they lost their seed to soil contact. No problem, you go buy something else, you buy a Keaton seed for them to give you seed to soil contact. You can do that. I found though by buying a little bit deeper, my standard wheels work, I don't need spoked wheels because they were designed for the two to three inch blind depth. The spoked wheels, Martin Till, the new Till, the patents where the spokes came out, the word Till is still on the system. They're doing the tillage to dry out the seed zone, get rid of excess water at planting time. Even for them, it was too much tillage. They put a drag chain on behind to smooth that out and seal it back up so it doesn't dry out too much. For me, I want to keep all my water. I don't want to dry it out at planting time. Or you can look at less aggressive spokes. There's about 22 different companies out there that I think are making these spokes now. This is exacto spokes, the Thompson T-wheel, less aggressive, crumbles the soil, but it doesn't do as much deep tillage. Still has a Keaton seed firmer in there for seed to soil contact. Or to be less aggressive, you put on one spoked wheel, one conventional wheel. The conventional wheel gives you some firming, gives you some depth control, the spoke gives you some loose soil so the seed will close. Again, Keaton seed firmer still hiding in there for seed to soil contact. Or another less aggressive, the Dawn Curve Time. Again, one of each here in this case. But again, a lot of our producers run in standard wheels, just planting two and a half, three inches deep. The spring, we're a dry spring. We actually plant our corn about three and a half inches deep. We've got a beautiful standard corn, beautiful race roots forming now. Plant deeper. Now, the Martin Till, new Till said was their mudder planter for muddy conditions. Our mudder planter is a standard planter with minimal soil disturbance. This was a foggy morning. You can see some long soybean stubble out there. Remember I said we don't run a chopper anymore. People say you can't handle residue when it's wet. Sure you can if you've got sharp discs. It rained about an inch and a quarter the day before I'm out planting. This is a planting date study. That was the day to plant. Here's rear view of the planter that day. Notice the depth gauge was on the planter. It's not picking up any mud. They're riding on residue. Very seldom do we get rained out because we got minimal soil disturbance. Yes, I'm picking up a little bit in back, but the seed's already been placed by then. Mention this, Keaton, uh, seed firmer, Shaffer rebounders out there as well. They'll both catch the bouncing seed, get it down to the bottom of the seed V for a uniform seeding depth. I like that. And it will pay in a situation like this. Sort of at the far end of the row there, there's a little, sh I'm sorry, close end of the row. It's backwards now. There's a little short plant there. He was planted probably pretty shallow up on the side of the seed V, dry soil, and he didn't grow until it rained compared to his neighbors down deep. That yield difference there will pay for the Keaton or a rebounder. Definitely look at those devices when you're planting your corn. Get that seed down to proper seeding depth to make a good root system. Drills, air seeders. And I've got an hour presentation on planters, an hour presentation on drills, air seeders as well. To do it all in a half hour, this is going to be quick. Cut handle residue, penetrate soil, seed to soil contact, close the seed V. I already told you. Difference is, divide by four when it comes to residue flow. I showed you the plugged up drill earlier. Spread your residue at harvest. Multiply by four when it comes to weight. Here's a seeding demo. He says, our no-till drill works great. He started planting. Every seed was on top of the ground. He said, no problem. He started tightening down pressure springs. He says he can get 300 pounds per row. 300 times 24 openers is 7,200 pounds. I asked him, what is his drill weight? He says 5,000 pounds. 5,000 pounds this way and 7,200 pounds pushing up. And that's how many volunteers it took to make this demo work. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give Paul Yasa a nice big round of applause.